15 days after the Rockets fired Steven Silas, they already hired Ime Udoka as their next head coach. So we're about to dive into that. We're very excited. So you definitely want to stay tuned. All right, and welcome back to another emergency episode of the Bride and Will Show. I'm your first host, as always, Will. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter, at Bias Houston. Uh, you definitely want to tap in over there, because when news breaks, like what happened today, we're always, you know, find up the space immediately to talk about it. Um, so if you miss out on that space, it's, it's on over there. Uh, you can tap in with us next time something uh, big happens with the Houston Rockets. But that's where you can find all that stuff at, and I'll pass off the Brad. And as always, you can find my content at Brando NBA on Instagram, mainly Twitter, sometimes TikTok. Uh, and as Will said, those Twitter spaces, anytime any news breaks, we're going to be in there talking about the latest Rockets topics, as we are right now on this podcast. If you want to wait and listen on the Brando and Will show, you can definitely do that. And you, you can make sure to subscribe and catch every single episode. That's your choice, and we ain't going to be mad at that. But for today's episode, again, they hired Ime Udoka. We're very excited. We got our friend of the show on, Paulo Alves. So... If you don't know where to find Paulo on social media, Paulo, let the listeners know where they can find you. Yeah, what's up, everyone? Good to be back. Y'all can find me on Twitter at NBA. That's where you'll find everything I do. Uh, I'll just take the chance to plug at the Lager Wine on Twitter. That's the podcast I have with Bandy Post. Check us out. There you go, yeah, man. And like I said, we had to get Paulo on today. Uh, it was super short notice, but it's what you got to do when, when the Rockets hired uh, their head coach today. Um, but yeah, man, we wanted to just come on and talk about, you know, our initial reaction to the, the hiring, um, some thoughts on just kind of what that means for us, for Ima Udoka, for the players on the on the team, what to kind of expect next season. And then we were going to talk to, you know, some guys who maybe are going to come over with Udoka, maybe not kind of our thoughts on that. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll let the guests go first for our first segment. Just Paula, what was your initial reaction? What were you doing? What was the first thing that came to your mind uh, when that notification came across your phone? I mean, I was excited. Uh, listen, I'm not gonna lie. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna go ahead and tell you that Yudoko was my number one guy. It was actually my number two. Uh, number one was Nurse for me, but I, I was, I have kind of settled on. Listen to me. There's top. There's two. There's three top guys. There's Nurse. There's Yudoka, and there's Atkinson, who I don't think was, you know, that considered. But as long as you get one of those top three, to me, you're getting a really big name at coach that's defensive focused, which is to me the most important thing, and that's going to hold guys accountable. And Idoka fits the bill perfectly. He's not Nurse, but I'm not sure even if he won't be better than Nurse. It, we're just projecting stuff, right? So I was just, I was really excited. I think he's going to be a great hire. Obviously, there's questions with the background and what happened with the Celtics. But at the end of the day, you just can't forget that this is a guy that had one season in the NBA as a head coach, had a long history as an assistant. He comes from the, the Greg Popovich tree, which is, you know, usually a great sign for head coaches. Uh, and in that season, he took a Celtics team that was coming off a, a, a 500 season to the two seed and eventually to the finals where they, well, Rockets podcast, well, they, where they sadly lost to the Warriors, which I guess is the fate of the universe. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, I, I really value what he brings as far as defense and accountability. I think those are the two, the two main traits that you, that Rockets needed out of a head coach. And so my initial reaction was just, hey, we got one of those top three guys to me the the star head coach is available on the market i don't think in most years you, you get guys as good as nurse yudoka and atkinson available and so it was kind of to put it to, to make an analogy it was kind of when you when you're tied to rumors of trading for a star right and it doesn't always happen there's always a chance even if you're the front runner there's always a chance that new head coaching positions open up and you know you're not able to to hide the guy you wanted anymore, so it was the confirmation of something that we had already suspect suspected, and it's good that they capitalized on it because I mean my number one priority this off season was we need to get in a coach that's you know top tier that's going to uh, be independent, not take shit from the front office, and I think it was a big step that even towards the narratives that were going around about how Ralph Olson was meddling with the team. Hey, he went out and he got a guy that's not going to take any shit. So to me, that's a that's a great step. Yeah, just my initial reaction. I was surprised that it happened so quickly. As I touched on in the intro, only 15 days it took for the Rockets to find their next head coach after firing Stephen Silas. It's good to see again, as we touched on in our podcast about you know the Rockets having different coaches that they're looking into, having an all-star cast of 
Uh, I was going to say Frank Vogel first, but I mean, Frank Vogel is a good coach. We got Idoka, <laughs> we had Kenny Atkinson, and of course, Nick Nurse, which everybody would have loved to see. And even Sam Cassell, like they had great um, options to choose from. And seeing Adoka get chosen a few days after he was interviewed, if I'm mistaken, they got in, he got interviewed on Wednesday of this past week. And boom, like next week, he, he's already that guy. So I'm very excited when I, when I got the news. I, I, I was all smiles. Um, this is the guy who's going to come in. It really improved this roster in a lot of ways, um, playmaking wise, defense wise, accountability wise, and in the next game, I'm definitely going to go into that a lot deeper. But that was just my initial reaction. I'm very excited. Will, what were your thoughts on the real side? Yeah, I mean, I was I was telling y'all, you know, off camera. Um, when the notification hit my phone, I was actually in a um, in a space like yelling at the top of my lungs at uh, at Warriors fans because they were. They were trying to argue to me that uh, that they would have won the championship in 2015 if Kyrie and Kevin Love played. And I was like, man, y'all out your mind. And then, you know, I'm mid-argument, and I see the notification come across my screen. I'm like, yeah, I got to go now. Like, this is this is more important. So um, uh, I, I, I'm with Paula. I touched on the podcast and a lot on the TL and in spaces. Nick Nurse was my top candidate. Um, that's probably my favorite coach in the NBA. Um, and so I was obviously, like, very ecstatic uh, when Toronto lost to Chicago in the play-in, and then they fired him. Uh, I think it was like late last week. And, you know, we were talking about, you know, maybe he was going to be the guy for the Houston Rockets. Um, but I did say like on the TL and in spaces and on the podcast that, you know, I had Udoka as my second choice. And this isn't like a, a oh man, like no, I'm still like, so, like this is, this is, oh, this is still a, a great hiring choice. This is still, um you know, a, a great step forward. And I think that um, while Nick Nurse was my top candidate, I think there are some things that I'm going to, I'm going to touch on later on the, in the podcast that like, Udoka does that Nick Nurse does not, which, you know, if you look at through a different lens, you know, you'd say, well, maybe he makes more sense for this team than Nurse did anyways, you know? Um, but yeah, man, like just all around, I'm just super duper excited. Um, like this is, like I so said, this is not a, a a consolation prize. This is this, he was still a big fish out there in his own right. Um, and, you know, it, it's crazy that the Houston Rockets, the story, the narrative behind the Houston Rockets all year was that we were a, a dumpster, we were dysfunctional that no one would want to come here, no one want to coach here. You know, we were we were a problem, the worst place in the NBA. Um, and you look at it, and like like Brad touched on, all the guys we were linked to this summer for – this summer, this offseason um, for head coaches, those were like the top guys. Like like we we had some of the best coaches available. Like you could argue Udoka was the best coach available um, on the market right now. He was someone who was uh, sought after – um, by Brooklyn and Toronto before, you know, ultimately deciding here in Houston. We're going to touch on that a little bit later in the podcast, too. Um, but just to, to walk away with, like, such a highly touted coach, um, I mean, you know, after everything that we went through this season and, you know, despite all the the dysfunctional, this guy still chose us, um, I have nothing but, like, excitement. I mean, like, I I, I have my my joy back. I'm, I'm excited for Houston Rockets basketball again. So uh, that, that was just my initial reaction. I think, I think we all kind of gave our – our reactions to that, like I said, I want to kind of now dive into like the the nitty gritty, like the the ins and outs of what we were actually, you know, what Udoka means for Houston and you know all that stuff. So I have a bunch of stuff I'm gonna talk on. Um, I'm gonna let Paulo go first. I'll get let you go, Brad. Then, like I said, I'm gonna, I have a bunch I gotta talk about with Udoka. Yeah, man. As as far as Udoka goes, I think um, just to justify a little bit, I think versus Nurse, I think there's also things that, as you said, favor Udoka over Nurse. I think Udoka has a more a more grading personality. He's going to you know, have rougher relationships all around the team versus Yudogo was more of a guy who is going to look like he's on your side, but he's also going to hold you accountable. And he's going to be like, I don't know, I'm not going to say a father figure because these guys are all, are all you know, 20 something years old, but that, that, sort of, that sort of thing. And I think long term that has value because, well, let's assume as a normal head coach, everything goes right and either one would, would, would stay here for four years, right? That's going to be a significant chunk of the of the time that these players spend here between their rookie contracts and their first extensions. And I think the way you get players to be, you know, one franchise guys like Damian Willard is you draft them, you you develop them, and then you make sure that their time in, in the city it, they have a great time, so they feel indebted and they stay here long term, like Willard has in Portland. And so these four years could be key towards that having having a head coach that's going to make sure that. You know, be tough when it needs to be tough, but also be on your side when it needs to be on your side. Is more the personality that fosters that rather than Nick Nurse, who is going to get results, no questions asked, but he's also going to you know damage relationships. He's going to you know, while demanding the best out of you, you're going you're going to grow tired of him as a lot of the players did in Toronto. I mean, other than that, 
I think one of the most exciting things for me is I would bet that he bring in that or that one of the coaches that he'll bring in is James Borrego. Uh, they have history dating all the way back to their San Antonio days uh, under Pop. Uh, Borrego was one of the candidates for the Rockets. He got an interview. Uh, I know for a fact that the Rockets really liked the interview they had with him. And although the Rockets won't set whatever um, uh, assistant coaching staff uh, that Yudoka wants to bring in, the fact that they like him and that he has ties with Yudoka makes me think that there's something there. And I, I'm excited for it. I mean, Kelly Eco had a great piece about uh, Jim Borrego and the way he orchestrates an offense, and he likes to use a lot of dribble handoffs. He's a, he's a, he used a player like Shingun really well. And so I actually think that this is a great hire for Shingun. And I think uh, that balance between Yudoka as the defensive minded guy, and, as the head coach, because I think it's important that the, the defensive minded guy is the head coach, he's the, you know, the guy calling the shots, and having James Borrego as the defensive minded, as the offensive minded guy, rather. Uh, it's a nice balance, and I'd be really excited if that's what they bring on as as the offensive lead system. Yeah, the things that I wanted to touch on, Will said we're going to get into the nitty-gritty, so getting into that kind of zone, I wanted to talk about what the Celtics did in their transition from Brad Stevens going to Ime Udoka. In that one season, as Paulo mentioned, when the Celtics were 36 and 36, they weren't a really good passing team, and I wanted to dive into that. So they were, 20, they were 25th in the NBA in assists per game at 23.5, when I look at the Houston Rockets, that's a team that's really bad at passing the basketball. Worse in the NBA in assists and at the bottom of the league in turnovers as well. So that's a big need for improvement. Now, when I look at Udoka, when he took over the Celtics team, he came in and um, he moved that offense to seventh in the league in assists. And there was a stretch. Um, if you look back at that Celtics roster and that Celtics season, they were really bad to start, very average. And then they went on a 28-7 and seven run to finish the year, and that's how they ended up getting the second seed and end up going to the finals. But in that stretch when they went 28-7, they're actually fifth in the NBA assists in that stretch. So they were really moving the ball a lot better. And that's a roster, if you look at it up and down, they don't have any elite playmakers. They have some good playmakers at, uh, at the center position. You have a guy like Al Horford who can pass really well, Rob Williams who can pass really well. So when I think of it like that, I think Shane Goon, as Paula mentioned, can thrive really well, bringing a guy like James Borrego, who had the, the Hornets passing the ball really well as well. They, I think I want to say they were top two in the, uh, in the league in assists. The year before he was fired. So that's that's a good hire. Uh, and I'm happy that you mentioned that. So I was excited from that standpoint. This is a Rockets team that was claimed to be looking like an AU team. They tried to run some plays and then it would just be a free for all from there. So that's what got me the most excited uh, looking in that regard. And another thing on that same topic, secondary assists, the Rockets, they don't move the ball around a lot. It goes into that little playground style that we were talking about isolation. Um, Udoka brought that team from 24th in uh, secondary assists to second in the NBA in secondary assists. That means they're really moving that ball, making that extra pass. That's what makes a good team great. You look at the Golden State Warriors. I know it's a Rockets spot, but look at the Golden State Warriors. They make a lot of great extra passes. Um, every great team has to do it, and that's uh, what he doing with the Celtics team. So excited from a playmaking standpoint. And then I also wanted to touch on the defense. Um, he brought that defense from 13th in defensive rating to first in defensive rating. This was a defense that Udoka had switching a lot more. Al Horford was thriving. I can look at a guy like Jabari Smith, Tari Eason, really thriving in this system. And um, Shane Goon, uh, you can think, oh, switch defense, how are they going to run him? Uh, do you know who Ali Khan Bajani is on Twitter? He pointed out, and I was going to talk about in this podcast, he had Robert Williams, probably their worst perimeter defender in that starting lineup. He was guarding the worst perimeter um, player on the other team, so I'm assuming Shane Goon would probably do the same thing under Udoka if he's going to be on this team next year, and hopefully he will be. But I'm assuming um, they're going to implement – uh, something that they were doing um, on that Boston team in their first in the league in defense. So I'm excited for that. And um, last thing I wanted to touch on, um, Udoka, he worked with Kawhi Leonard back in uh, San Antonio back in 2012. And one of the things that he told him and that he wanted to tell uh, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown when he was becoming the head coach was, there's no reason to wait for anything. You have the work ethic, you have the talent. Go out there and be a vocal leader and go out there and get it every single day. And that's something that I'm assuming he's going to tell Jalen Green, he's going to tell Jabari Smith. He's going to tell this Rockets young core, and I'm just excited to see where he can take them. Uh, as Paulo mentioned, the accountability is going to be a lot better. And as I mentioned right now, I think the uh, assist per game is going to go up. The ball is going to be a lot better. The defense should be a lot tighter. So that's why I wanted to touch on those three things. 
I'm gonna go ahead and institute a, a no more Warriors talk on this this show. Like uh, that's that's not twice that y'all have mentioned Golden State <laughs> on my podcast, but um, uh, but not. <laughs> uh, but no, I want to uh, start by I think Paulo touched on it. Like I said, I got a lot I want to touch on. Um, but Paulo talked about it. Um, one, this guy is someone who comes from the Greg Popovich tree, um, and we know how those guys do in the NBA. That's that's usually a good sign that like. You know, I mean, because Greg Popovich is arguably the greatest coach of all time. Um, And so anybody who's able to spend as much time as he did, take as much, you know, much from Greg Popovich and implement that into his own, um, you know, style as as a coach. And, like, obviously he got Greg Popovich's blessing um, as a head coach. Like, to me, that means a lot because we know who Greg Popovich is, what he means to basketball. Like, the guy's arguably the greatest head coach of all time. So just that pedigree alone means a lot to me. But then he also came from, the, you know, from Brad Stevens, you know, coming from from learning from that guy right who was a great head coach in his own right for those um those you know 2010 boston celtics teams that saw routine success throughout that whole decade um you know and so you know being able to learn from two of the best coaches you know one of all time and one from the last decade um being able to take what he's learned from those two guys and bring it to the table as a head coach i think that's really really cool um and something that i'm going to be looking forward to as, as his time as our head coach um but the first thing that i did when we hired udoka um, while everybody's kind of getting their thoughts off in this space, I started like researching, um, you know, kind of just who he is, what his coaching style is, what people have to say about him. Um, and one of the things that I kept seeing, you know, from article to article, you know, just I was looking at different quotes from from players or um, from people who, you know, worked in the San Antonio Spurs organization or from the Celtics organization, just anybody who'd been around Ime um, uh, Udoka. One of the consistent things that I was hearing is that he's the kind of coach who's going to be. He's going to be a player's coach for sure. Like he's going to have your players back. Your players are going to respect him. Um, they're going to they're going to like playing for him. You know, he's going to be the type of guy who, um, especially like I think to a, a, a young team like us, um, they may not need to 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 have that like super duper uh, tough love kind of say. Like they might they might you know respond better to something more on the lines of like someone who can relate to them. Um, but at the same time, even though he's going to be a player's coach and relate to the to the players. He's not going to be a pushover, right? Like he's not going to let you walk over him. He's not going to let you, you know, this isn't going to be a, well, we're going to decide what we want to do today. And you're just the coach, just figure it out. And you're like, no, it's it's his team. He's going to, he's, he's going to, he's going to lay down the law essentially. Um, and, and so to me, that was like, that was really cool to hear because that kind of reminds me of uh, maybe, maybe a bad analogy or bad comparison. But I look at like what Steven Silas did as the head coach of the Houston Rockets. And I don't think Steven Silas was the, was the guy for this team. I think you know letting him go this offseason was the right decision to make. Um, but the one thing is someone who who was out on Steven Silas as the head coach for, for pretty much the majority of last season, um, the one thing that I will never take away from Steven Silas is I think that he did a really, really good job of connecting with the players. Right? Like I, I, I've said all the time, if we could have kept Steven Silas as like a player development coach, I would have loved it because I think that he's really good at, at, at relating to the guys and, and getting to know them personally. Um, you know, evidence, you know, by how the guy, you know, he teared up when KPJ got a contract extension. And that wasn't, you know, that was that was real. Like that was that was really motion um, that he had experienced, you know, for I think through genuine love he has for KPJ. Um, and then you look at a guy like Nick Nurse, who one of the things that Raptors fans was kind of telling us about him is that he's kind of not that guy. He's more of like a, you know, come in, do your work, go home kind of guy. Right. And so I think that, you know, even though I was I was team Nick Nurse, I think that one thing that, you know, Yudoka has working for him is he seems to be kind of like that balance between the two styles of coaching where, like, I think he can be the player's coach who, you know, you 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 love and you, you know, you, you, you like talking to and making fun of, you know, hanging out with stuff like that. But at the same time, like, you're not going to walk over him. He's going to have that same sternness that, like, a Nick Nurse would have. So I, I think that was really cool. Um, then another thing, obviously, accountability was, like, the biggest thing that we as um, as Rockets fans were asking for uh, last season, and actually just last season, just in general, under the Steven Silas um, era. And like, once again, I think Paul touched on it, like that's that's who Udoka is. We're not gonna have no more of those accountability issues at all, you know, with Udoka, that's, that's not happening no more. You know, guys are gonna be held responsible for their actions on and off the court. Um, and I'm like, so I'm more so looking forward to like what that means on the court. I'm tired of watching guys go out there and not try and, you know, give half effort um, you know, I, I'm tired of that. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're going to have someone who kind of like, I don't, for lack of a better term, like lays down the law um, and, you know, doesn't let that stuff happen anymore. Um, Brad touched on it, right? Um, he, the Celtics started that season 17 and 19, two games under 500, and then went to the finals. They finished that season on a 28 and 7 run, 
and they went to the like, – I don't think people understand how crazy that is to start, you know, almost half the season you're under 500. And then you go all the way it – it was the second seed, right, Brad? That's, that's where they finished last – yeah, go all the way to the second seed and then go to the finals. And it wasn't like they just lucked into that. No, the Celtics were legit um, when they when they made that switch. They were they were a legit team. They played some tough teams in the playoffs. Uh, they swept the KD, Kyrie, Brooklyn Nets. Um, they, you know, they had that really tough battle with the, with the Miami Heat in the conference finals. And even though, like, they did fall short um, in the finals, like, they showed a lot of resilience and, like, for how young that team was, they, I think, you know, everybody was kind of impressed with how they performed on that stage. There was obviously room for improvement, but like, you know, just how they handled last season, considering where they started. I mean, like, that's, that's incredible to me, man. And and that shows to me, um, he has, he has the ability to command a locker room because anybody can't do that, bro. Like, you know, just, just speaking from like a morale standpoint, like we were, you know, we, we know what, I mean, we're the Houston Rockets. We know what losing does to the mentality of the players in the locker room. Right. And, especially a team like for us, it's a little different because like we knew we were going to lose, but the Celtics were a team that had expectations to compete for a championship. So can you imagine like how deflating it is to be in that locker room, knowing that like you're supposed to be winning a championship this year and you're two games under 500. And he was able to find a way to to not only like keep that locker room together, but they came out of that a lot better than they went into it. And like, like like I said, that tells me, he knows how to command a locker room. He knows how to galvanize the troops. Um, That's something that we have been like sorely missing. Like I think, I don't even know if Mike D'Antoni could do that, man. Like, and that was that was our that was the guy we had, um, you know, for the last the last decade as well. So that was really cool to me. Um, and then I want to just touch on like the players. Um, uh, I think I, I won't even touch on on Shingoon and and and, and um, Shingoon because I think y'all touched on that really well. Um, but like one of the things I think helped Jason Tatum kind of elevate into that next tier of superstar was the the playmaking leap that he took under uh Ime Udoka, right? Like you look at kind of how he was making those reads against that Miami Heat defense in the conference finals last year. Um like that was something that Ime Udoka kind of helped implement and kind of helped coach uh Jason Tatum up to do. And I've been saying I said in the space, I've been saying for a while now that like I think what's going to separate uh Jalen Green from his peers and like what's going to elevate him to like that top tier status of stars or superstardom is his ability to be the complete deal offensively, right? And so if he can take that leap from a playmaking standpoint, I mean, I I, I think that guy is, for, is a surefire superstar, but what he's going to bring from a scoring standpoint. So um, I'm really excited to see what Brad, oh, what Ime Udoka does with, with Jalen Green on that department. Um, and then like Jabari Smith and Tari Eason, just the two defensive wings, like uh, Ime's calling card is on the defensive end anyways. Um, and so just seeing what he's going to do with those two guys and, and, you know, those are, those are guys who we, we all believe in their defensive ability. So seeing what, you know, a defensive minded coach like Udoka that with that pedigree, what he's going to bring to the table for those two guys, I'm really, really excited for that. Um, and yeah, man, I, I, I just want to end my, my, my soapbox with this. I'll say that, um, um, I know that it ultimately doesn't have any bearing on his ability to coach a basketball team or the on-court product itself. But as a black man myself, it means a lot that like our next head coach for the next, you know, however many years that this is the guy's gonna lead us to the future, like that he also is a black man. Um, and then you know, like you know, we have um Devico Ryan's the Texans, and um, why am I drawing a blank here? Um, with the Astros, why am I drawing a blank? Uh, Dusty Baker. Dusty Baker, yeah, I'm drawing a blank. I was on here, I was trying to tell you Dusty, my fault. Yeah, I could, I could it, it completely slipped my mind right there. But yeah, Dusty Baker, like having three the three major sports in our city all have black head coaches and Astros are already successful rockets were on the trend up where i you don't know what the texans are going but but you know like like that that means something to me man like 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 the but the meme says like that means something to me that like all three of those guys are african-american coaches um and like i i believe in Demico ryan's i believe in udoka uh dusty's already proven um like I, that that means a lot to me so like i'll, I'll in my soapbox there I wanted to say this really quick, and I wanted to pass it off to Paulo because I know you wanted to chime in. But what you were saying with the Grant Wood, I you didn't talk about Grant Williams, but you're talking about Tari and Jabari being those those guys that Udoka's gonna like. Grant Williams is the guy who took a really big leap as well defensively. Um, six eight guy, very gritty, good defender. Um, I, when I, when I saw his leap, I was happy for a guy like Tari Eason. I think he's gonna get a lot more minutes next year. So that's just a player I'm, I'm excited about next season. But Paulo, that's all I want to say. I'll kick it off to. Yeah, I mean. That's a perfect segue. I mean, I was going to talk about the fact that he's a player's coach and that, and that he's respected around the league and the fact that even after what happened, guys like Kalen Brown, guys like Jason Tatum, after he left, still talk so, so fondly about him, has to bode well for a team that has 60 million in cap space and is looking to draw, to draw free agents in. 
whether it is this year, whether they're delayed for, for next year, that's a plus with uh, freaking it okay in. And one of those guys, exactly, Grant Williams, is going to be a restricted free agent this summer. And he was coached by Yudoka, and he had his breakout season with Yudoka as his head coach. Who knows if that plays a factor? The Celtics are a team, you know, we know how the new CBA is, is really punishing teams that are over the second apron. I'm, I don't have the math in front of me, but I I would guess that the Celtics, knowing that have Brogdon, Smart, Brown, uh, Horford, Rob Will, Tatum, like, that can't be cheap. They must be close to it. I wonder how much they can afford to pay Grant Williams or how much they would match because – Although we have a lot of defensive wings, I mean, he's good. So you, you want to add good players. So uh, who knows? Maybe that's an option. Just want to touch on that free agency side. And then when it comes to being a, a player, not not a player a player's coach, if we look at the four options that we had, or the, the, the top four options, which were uh, Yudoka, Vogel, Nurse, and Atkinson, if you were looking at those four names, if I had to pick one that to be the one that's going to tell Kevin Porter Jr. that he likely has to come off the bench this season and have him embrace that role and, to me, reach his full potential because I'm a KPJ fan. I want him to succeed here because I think he's a tremendous story. I think Yudoka is the best. You couldn't pick a better guy to, you know, take that step and, and, and hopefully guide KPJ through that adaptation and especially if someone like James Harden comes in. I think that's another big plus. And the last thing I'd, I'd like to touch on is... I think I, I, I'd, I'd like to really reiterate how good this is for Albert Shingo. Because, I mean, if you get Wemby, um, and if you get Wemby, now you can the, you can run Wemby as the in the role that Robert Williams was playing, and you can have Shingo try to emulate where Al Harford, what Al Harford was doing. Um, and I think, ultimately, if Shingo is to be a, a good a good or a, a passable defender in the NBA, Al Harford is someone who he should look to emulate. And if Yudoka is used to uh, or has ran the defense in the past, I mean, if you go back and look, and I, I had a pod, we had a pod with with the guy that covers the Celtics for, for, for um, USA Today, what he said was that that turnaround in January, where they were two games below 500, and then they, they went on a streak until... To the end of the season, the change that they made, the change that they made that led to that, was running Robert Williams as that in that free safety role, and and having uh, Al Horford on the weakest defender, or the weakest perimeter uh, perimeter offensive player, and ha- having used his IQ because I think Klingon is, is a smart player. He just doesn't have the best tools. And he could be, you know, compared to what Al Horford is nowadays, not prime Al Horford, but what he is nowadays, in a guy that doesn't have a lot of the athleticism, but he's just really smart in the way that he plays defense. So, and besides that, um, another nugget, it was reported also by uh, by Celtics Wire that the, the Celtics had the Rockets not traded up for Shane Yun. Celtics were one of the teams that had mm-hmm. them high on them and wanted to draft Shane Yun to pair him up with Robert Williams. So, you know, Shengun being would be the all what all hard for this today for the Celtics. And so that comparison in terms of how you'd run the both of them, it even bodes well for who knows if it's now Wemby, even if it's Jabari, or if they bring in more of a rim running center to play next to Shengun, it bodes well for, for Shengun's future with the team, which I was not that optimistic about. But I think with Yudoka and the fact that not only on, on defense, like I just explained, but on offense. Uh, the Celtics tried a lot of triple handoff stuff. They, they didn't have a true point guard, and so they had, to, in order to get Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown advantages that they could capitalize on, which, by the way, they're fairly comparable to Jalen Green and Javari Smith, although the skill levels are obviously different because they're two all-stars. Who knows what Javari and, and, and Jalen will be? No, uh, there's a lot of overlap, although, although it's not exact matches to what the Celtics have. It's mostly worse defensively, but kind of similar offensively matches uh there's a lot of there's a lot of, of things that connect this rocket score and what they project to be with what you look ahead with the celtics yeah last thing i wanted to touch on and i'm happy that you talked about grant williams being a potential restricted free agent guy i wanted to add that this was a team and if i'm not mistaken yeah paulo i was gonna ask you what happened with your light situation <laughs> I, was gonna say, I don't know what happened, dude. I should have said so. That was too funny. I was going to say, though, with Grant Williams, I want to say the Rockets were rumored to be talking to them about Jay Sean Tate around that trade deadline, so they wanted to get a cheaper salary. So Grant Williams could be an option there. That's a guy, again, really good defender, can shoot the three ball really well. That would be interesting um, if the Rockets go out and get him. 
I really just want, wanted to right now talk about some potential free agent guys that would fit well with this coach. And I've talked about it before, but even now I want to talk about it. Patrick Beverly, I think, is a guy that would fit really uh, really well with this coach. Uh, Marcus Smart, last season, won Defensive Player of the Year under Coach Udoka. And Patrick Beverly is a pest. He, he loves running around, being pesty, a switch defense. Um, you can think about Patrick Beverly playing against Kevin Durant in the uh, first round of the playoffs when he was on the Clippers, really embracing a matchup like that. Obviously, he probably didn't succeed to the best of his abilities, but – He's willing to take on that challenge, and he'd be, be able to take on any challenge. I'd love to have a guy like that off the pitch for the Houston Rockets. But that's the last thing I wanted to say. I'm excited to see what they do in the free agency. Um, first and foremost, we're going to have to see what happens on May 16th. That's the day everybody's waiting for it because they get Wimby, Scoop. Um, I mean, there's a variety of ways, a variety of the players they get. So I'm curious to see how that how that draft turns out. So Or a lottery, I should say. But that's the last thing I want to touch on. Uh, at add this. Um... I know a lot of people were hoping, because uh, I think I think Paula touched on it. Uh, Jalen Brown uh, spoke a very highly of uh, Brad. I'm uh, not of Brad Stevens. I keep saying Brad Stevens of Ime Udoka, um, and and like that was somebody he really really liked playing for. As a matter of fact, I think Jason Tatum said like that was the best coach he's ever played for. So that, that's worth something. Like I, if you're ever like- he played for Coach K as well, which leaves a, a very good impression on most most guys that go through yeah. Duke. I would say if you're ever bored one day, just like go look up the different like quotes from all the guys in the NBA or like basketball adjacent. Uh, I, mean, you know, I spent a lot of time today looking at it. There's a lot of really good quotes um, for this guy. But what I want to say is, and I'm, I'm gonna kind of, I guess, steer the conversation in this direction a little bit. Um, I know that like we were some of the people, I know at least me and Brad were like very on board with Jalen Brown in Houston. And that, that was one thing that's kind of like gonna be circling out there with, you know, who knows what happens with him this summer. Um, I, although I think he's going to make all the teams him to get a super max, and I don't think he's going anywhere when that happens. But, like, let's just speak hypotheticals here because that's, that's what we do on, on Rockets Twitter. Um, like, that was something that's, that's kind of rumored out there that, like, you know, if Yudoka comes, he might try to bring Jalen Brown with him. Those are two guys who like each other. Jalen Brown may not be too happy with his role in Boston or whatnot. Like, you know, there was a bunch of rumors about him being unhappy, and, and Bill Simmons, like, explicitly said, he you know, he thinks he wants to come to Houston. Um and, and here's here's my thing, man. Like, I, I talked about it in spaces and a little bit on the TL. I don't think I talked about it on the pod just yet. But I would love Jalen Brown in Houston. Let me let me start there. Like, if if I could just drop a guy in a vacuum on this team, like, obviously I'd love Jalen Brown. I, I think um, he would. You know, I, I disagree with people who say that like him and Jalen Green are redundant. I think I think that you know you can have a redundancy in strengths, and I, I think that that's that's fine. Like, I, I have no problem with my shooting guard small forward tandem being Jalen Green and Jalen Brown. Like, that's not the problem to me. The problem to me is the when uh, we will be trading for Jalen Brown, right? Because I think that he's going to cost a lot. Like Boston does not want to lose that guy. And in any scenario where they're trading, they're probably going to, you know, probably going to be a third team involved where we send our young pieces and, and draft capital to a third team that sends um, sends Boston a star and then they send Jalen Brown. That's like I've seen like Bradley Bill, like Damian Lillard, is it like a third team that can kind of go to Boston, kind of be floated out there, and then like Jalen Brown comes to Houston, and then our, our young guys go to like Portland or Washington, something like that, so like they can hit the rebuild. And my thing is, is like in terms of value, I think that's fair value for Jalen Brown because he's probably going to cost us like some combination of Tari, Shingon, and like three or four for a draft picks, which like I said, in, in a vacuum, like that's, that's what Jalen Brown's worth. So I'm not even mad at the value. I just think that it's way too soon to, to make an, a, a trade of that magnitude this offseason um because i just i just don't think i don't think there's any historical precedent um uh, of 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 a team this like like we're obviously we're trying to we're kind of bring the rebuild to a kind of a close here but like we're not close to winning a championship man like we won 22 games this year and we won 20 the year before that like we're not we're not anywhere close we need to worry about making the like the play-in tournament let alone winning a championship um and i think every time a team makes like all-in moves like that before they're ready I think it always backfires. Like I, I, I think that there's, there's not many historical precedents of that ever like ending well for the team that went. Like it, it, it sometimes doesn't even work for the team that goes all in, right? Like the Nets um, with KD, Kyrie, and, and James Harden probably regret doing that now that like it's all blown up in their faces and they're having to to navigate this rebuild with the worst contract in the NBA and you know none of their none of their own draft picks, right? Um, and so I just think that like, I think that was a, a necessary risk to take if you're if you're Brooklyn, because if you compare Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving and James Harden together, you got to do it every time. You know, like you would do that again today if you could. But like the Houston Rockets, where we're so far away from contention, I just think that there's a world where it ends up really well. 
but it's also a world where it ends up really, really bad. And I don't think it, I don't think that we should take that risk this this soon. Like Nate, let's 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 keep building and turning, let's keep developing, let's keep you know making smart moves, smart signing, smart trades. Um, and then like when like I think what the Cavaliers did with Donovan Mitchell, I think that's like a, a even though that's they're about to maybe lose this series, but I, I think that that was a really good trade for them because you already had Darius Garland and Jared Allen who were all-star caliber guys or you know really good NBA players. Evan Mobley is someone who I know it's like it's like a, a a bad word on Rockets Twitter, but he you know he's he's shows a lot of potential, a lot of a lot of promise um, as a young player. Like people believe a lot in that guy. When you have a foundation like that, on, on top of like a, just a veteran roster in general, they probably would have won 50 games last season if um, if uh, Allen didn't get hurt, right? When you have a, a solid foundation like that, yeah, I'm, I'm all in for you know trading for a Donovan Mitchell or a Jalen Brown or whoever. But I think when you're so far away from that, I I just I don't know. That's just my opinion. I think it would be a bad decision to do that this offseason. Yeah, I think there's to your point, I think there's a lot of weaknesses that our players are going to have when when they actually that we're only going to find out that they have when they start to play meaningful basketball. That it's tough to predict what's going to fit well with them. And although Jalen Brown fits with basically any team in the league, you might not that his skill set might not be what you need or might might overlap. If you have a lot of scorers, right? Although Jalen Brown can play defense, you're probably better off tra- trading for a more defensive minded player. That doesn't bring you as much as on offense because that's what you're lacking. And our team is so we, we are so unsure about what this team's going to be that it's you're going to spend your assets now. And then I mean, look at the, the Rockets are a prime example of this. Look at the James Harden years in Houston. We were constantly constantly stripped for assets. Um, it reached the point where when we traded for Robert Covington, we had to give up one of our core pieces to get enough assets to then trade for Rocco. And so if you if you don't have an idea of what the missing piece is, and a lot of, a lot of the time it's just a role player, don't spend your assets in a way that you're not going to be able to make that move when the time comes. Um, a lot of people think that we have a lot of picks, but that's just not true. We, I mean, now that we have one extra pick in this draft, and then after that, we have just a normal amount of picks that a team has one per year. So it's not like we have this huge surplus of picks. A lot of those we already picked. We had three picks, two drafts in a row. We have we have two picks this year, and so that surplus is gone. We have young players, and if you, and and if the Celtics took an offer that was based around mostly young players, if they valued Garuba, Josh Christopher, Ty Ty Washington, guys like that, a lot higher than market value, then maybe. But if you're going to spend picks, which is the, the more liquid currency of the NBA, it's tough to sell you on that move, especially because if it doesn't work out, it's not like you can trade the rest of the pieces and build around Jalen Brown because he's not a number he's not a number one on a championship contender. If you were, then it's kind of a no-brainer to trade for him, but he's not. And so, I mean, maybe he is, but I don't think it's likely. Um, and so it's tough because you could be stuck in a situation where you trade for Jalen Brown. And you're in a situation kind of like what the Atlanta Hawks are right now, yep. where you have you have a young roster. You made your win now move. Now what? They don't work out. Now what? You don't have the picks. I mean, they're floating trading Trey Young. Is, is that what we want? Is that like a year or two years from now? It doesn't work out, and we're floating trading Killing Green because that's one of the only pieces we have right now that ha- that has real value that we can flip for a star. Just it doesn't really make sense when you can wait a little bit longer. And we're, when we're further away along the process, we can do that. Especially because a lot, the, it's not like we're desperate for improvement right now. Although we don't have our pick next year, you could probably project significant improvement or as much improvement as you as you as you would get because you're not going to go from a 20 win team to a 40 win team. You're going to get a lot of improvement just by young guys getting better, just by virtue of having a, a I mean, just a, you have to look from a completely different universe. They're not comparable. You can't compare Steven Silas to Ibe Yudoka. It's just like the worst coach I've ever seen versus one of the best in, in recent years. So you're going to get a lot, of, a lot of improvement from that. You're going to have another top draft pick. Who knows where it will land? But that that might not come as improvement for, from wins. But that's more talent to add on to the roster. You have $60 million in cap space. You're going to improve plenty this season. It's perfectly fine to wait one more year before actually spending assets. And the different and one last thing I want to say about it, the difference between trading for Jalen Brown and that being called rushing and trading for Jalen or, or, or signing James Harden, 
which a lot of people call rushing. The Just difference no assets. Is, yeah, you're not giving up picks for James Harden. You're giving up the cap space. But nowadays, nobody hits free agency anyway. I mean, go check who's free agent this year. Go check who's a free agent next year. The only attractive guys are restricted, and their teams could match. And it's so it's a whole different, tougher situation to deal with. The only reason why James Harden makes sense as a, you know, kind of a kind of a little bit of a rush is because he you know as we said he doesn't cost assets he costs cap space and any and nowadays in the NBA any contract is movable so if you need if you need to change courses later on you can still do that and you still have your picks to aid you in doing that so to me it's just it's to me it's way too early for Jalen Brown in specific maybe he stays with the Celtics and doesn't sign an extension for some reason because he doesn't make an all NBA team I'm not sure if he can get his max money right now um and maybe we're readdressing this next year and next year we take that extra step next year we are where the cleveland cavaliers were at the beginning of this year when they traded for them with mitchell and at that point maybe it makes sense right now i just think it's way too early yeah when it, when it comes to that topic jalen brown you know with Houston rockets it does sound very enticing you know we're just going off of three seasons and being extremely bad so obviously you, you hear a name like jalen brown you, you say oh i would love for that to happen but you really do have to wait you guys make a lot of great points um, personally, um, when I look at it, if they do bring in James Harden and say they do get Victor Wimbanyama, I would have to see what the price would be to get a guy like Jalen Brown. It would have to be one of those jackpot kind of situations in my eyes. I don't want them to force anything. Say they get like the fifth or sixth pick, pick in the draft and they get desperate and now they're in a situation where they say, oh no, we need to, we need to, you know, compete, 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 get a guy like Jalen Brown in and then lose a bunch of assets. I don't want to do something like that. Um, for me though, I'm more of a, okay, if this is a jackpot, then that's something I can see. But still, in that regard, I'd, I'd like to see the cost. It is not something I would force. Uh, I'm cool with waiting because these Brooklyn Nets pick could be, they could be extremely valuable. Um, this Nets team, I don't know how good they're going to be in the future. It might suck next year. Um, it'd be okay to wait. There's nothing to force. Um, we saw the Boston Celtics, they were able to get Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown from the Brooklyn Nets back in the day just from being patient and waiting. Um, that's something the Rockets could do as well. But also, um, at the end of this pod, I wanted to say um, Jimmy Butler is just going crazy. I don't know if y'all saw, but, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I want to add one thing I talk about Jimmy Butler. Um, I was going to say, you could talk me into, like, if our pick falls out to the top two, I, I'd be fine. If, like, my problem is the, is the players, honestly, man. Like, I, I can be talking to trading, you know, pick three on down and all the remaining Brooklyn Nets picks for, J, for Jalen Brown. Like, I, I can get behind that. But when we start talking about trading Shingon and Tari Eason and then picks on top of that, ah, man, it's just like I feel like that's a bad idea. And, like, I honestly, I know that, like, there's no way we get the trade done unless you include those assets. Um, and so it's just like, yeah, man, I, I think it's I think it's just too soon. Um, I think that the, the right course of action for the Rockets this offseason, stay the course. You know, just what, what we're doing right now, you, you may not win that many games. You might, you know, turn in a 30-35 win season next season, which um, and you might be given – uh, OKC a lottery pick, but like I would much rather continue the slow rebuild than try to accelerate it and then be like what a policy and be like the Atlanta Hawks because I, I mean I just don't know how you navigate that if you're the Hawks before Trey Young demands a trade. So um, yeah, man. Uh, like I said I, I I'm I'm not, uh, this is for me this is um the happiest I've been um shoot since since we drafted Jabari probably I, I didn't I wasn't happy at all oh no no no. No, this is the happiest I've been since KBJ got extended. I, I, I can confidently say it's the happiest I've been since KBJ got extended. I was not happy at all last season. Um, and so, yeah, man, like I'm excited for Rockets basketball again. Like I feel like we're finally a real basketball team. Um, it says a lot that this guy chose us over Toronto or, you know, all the other jobs out there. Um, and, you know, like I, I, I believe in Stone. I, honestly, I do. I know that's like a controversial take at this point, but I believe in Stone. Um, and you know, I, I think he can solidify that trust I have in him with this offseason. Which, I mean, if if our ability to bring in Udoka sells us anything, I think we're in for we're in for a treat this this summer. So, so all I gotta say, Jimmy Butler is him. Should have been a Houston Rocket. Uh, was that four years ago? Yeah. Um, yep. But yeah, man, I'm I'm out, man. Was it Thibs that that vetoed the trade? It was Tibbs, man. He was tripping. Terrible. He turned he turned down the Russell Westbrook package. For like Robert Covington, Dario Sarge, I think I think it was like a second round pick. Like it was a terrible decision that he made. Like, but whatever, man. Um, 
That's it. I'm, I'm out. Would you got anything else, Brad, Paula, or anything? The only thing I got to say is I got to thank Paula for coming on the show. As always, that was his third appearance. So as always, make sure to tap him with Paula on social media. So Paula, again, let them know what they can find. Yeah, I appreciate y'all having me on. It's always, it's always fun to, to record with you guys. Y'all can find me on Twitter at NBA. That's P-A-U-L-O-A-L-V-E-S-N-B-A. Everything I do from podcasts like this one to, you know, just general Twitter foolery, you you can find on there. Sounds good. Um, guys, again, we're uploading our off season. If you like what you're hearing, make sure to subscribe, uh, like the video, comment, do all that good stuff. But we appreciate y'all for listening, and we'll catch you guys this Sunday. Or Monday, I should say. So we'll catch you guys on Monday.